All right, well, we are going to continue in our study, Grace Changes Everything, through the book of Romans. And today we will be back in chapter 8. We're moving through chapter 8 a little slower. There's a lot of good stuff there. And um, we're back there this week. And last week we left off with Paul speaking of suffering with Christ that we may be glorified together. And before we continue on, I want to pause just a minute and consider this issue of suffering. And um, we sing about it a little bit today. And for many people, the reality of suffering, the problem, you might call it the problem of evil in the world, is something that causes people to doubt the goodness of God. Some people even doubt his existence when they see the greatness of evil in the world. And when faced with cruelty or suffering, the inevitable question is, why? What is the purpose of the pain that I experience and other people experience? And one person that felt that very acutely and, and impacted me from reading his, about his life is Elie Wiesel. He was a Nobel Prize winner, and he addressed this question of suffering nearly 50 years after he wrote the book, Night. I'm sure some of you have read that book, and that's a harrowing account of his experience in the Holocaust. And he wrote a new preface to that book in 2006, sort of reflecting decades after he first wrote the book, and he contemplated the purpose of his survival through a concentration camp. And this is what he said. It was nothing more than chance, he wrote. However, having survived, I needed to give some meaning to my survival. Was it to protect that meaning that I set to paper an experience in which nothing made any sense? And, you know, many people may have not experienced the horror of evil to the, to the level of Wiesel, and I'm not judging him because I didn't walk through those shoes that he did. But the question that he raises, it rings true. How do I make sense of suffering in my life and the life of other people? And as we turn to God's word today, I want you all to see something really important about this, that scripture does not deny or even avoid the issue of suffering. Actually, it's to the contrary. The Bible takes that issue head on. But in so doing, Scripture's purpose is not necessarily to answer all the questions of suffering. There's many questions that come up. The Lord actually does something better than that. And he promises hope, the hope of glory for eternity. And that is the ultimate answer, in a sense, to the question of suffering. And as we read Romans today, I want you guys to think about that. We're going to start out by reading about suffering, and Paul's going to expand on this glory that is our hope in the face of reality of how hard life can be. So look with me in Romans 8. We're going to start in verse 18 and read to verse 30. And Paul said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance." Likewise, the Spirit also helps us, helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. 
For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, he, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. That's some good news, isn't it? And this is the main truth that I want to share with you all from that passage today. It's this, that the assurance of future glory and God's sovereign intervention in our lives brings great hope in the face of suffering. And we all face struggles. We all face pain and tragedy in our life. And until we go to be with Jesus, there's this tension between what we experience in the Christian life now and what we are promised in terms of the hope of glory not yet realized. Sometimes you hear it referred to as the already and not yet of the Christian life, the experience. And through it all, we have this assurance that we have future glory, we have God's sovereign intervention in our life, and that brings us great hope as we face suffering in our life. And this passage I want to walk through that in three parts. First, Paul speaks of the hope of future glory. So we'll look at that. And then he gives us assurance of God's sovereign intervention in our life. And then he concludes again with this reminder about the glory that's in our future. And in essence, this topic of glory or glorification, it's like bookends of this passage. It's there at the beginning and it's there at the end. And we're going to start at that first bookend today about this glory. So we're going to look back at verse 18, but first let's start in 16 because I want to kind of give the context of 18. So in verse 16 it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so in those words, the Holy Spirit assures us that we are God's children and we all benefit from the privilege of that position before God. But at the same time, we still face suffering in this life, right? Has anybody in here experienced the reality of suffering, of pain, of loss in your life? I would venture to say everybody. But in that suffering, and this is the key, and this is amazing. We are not alone, and there's hope ahead. We're not alone, and there's hope ahead, okay? Paul declares that we suffer with Christ. So we know he already suffered for us on the cross. He's faced suffering as the sinless Son of God, really in a way that we don't even totally get, right? Because only he gets that. And remember what he cried in a sense, he suffered alone so that we would not on the cross. Remember what he cried on the cross? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so when we suffer as God's children, his presence and his love are always with us because he's already suffered for us. And Paul expounds on that truth at the end of this chapter, and Tony's going to speak about that next week, about the love of God, and nothing can separate us from that. And so he really dives deep into that, but we'll hold that off for, for next week. But here, Paul is drawing a connection between suffering and glory. And that points to the hope we have ahead. And if you look at Paul's writings, if you look at all of Scripture, there's this theme of suffering and glory being connected together, which is sometimes I don't think we connect those dots. And maybe in what we hear in popular Christianity, it's not so popular to talk about suffering, right? But the Bible does deal with this issue. And why is it important that there's this connection? Well, if our viewpoint is limited to this temporary life, we have no way to effectively deal with the problem of evil. The problem of suffering. As Ecclesiastes declares after, as the preacher in Ecclesiastes declares, after facing difficulty in death without remembering his creator, he says, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. 
And that's true. If you just look at the temporal life, the things right before us, only this life, there is an amazing amount of vanity. What is the point? And I think that's what Elie Wiesel was asking. But thankfully, there is another way. There is an eternal perspective that brings hope in the face of suffering. This is how the Apostle Paul described it in 2 Corinthians. He said, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that is the eternal perspective that Paul also brings to the Romans. The same that he brought to the Corinthian church. In commenting, in in what he said, again, I'll repeat it, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And Douglas Moo says this about that statement from Paul. He says, A Christian views the suffering of this life in a world-transcending context, that while not alleviating its present intensity, transcends it with the confident expectation that suffering is not the final word. And Moo continues, We must, Paul suggests, Weigh suffering in the balance with the glory that is the final state of every believer. And so weighty, so transcendently wonderful is this glory that suffering flies in the air as if it had no weight at all. And so, since it's so valuable, what is this glory that Paul's talking about? We've been saying glory, glory. What is that? What what is glory? Well, I think for one, we will only know that fully in eternity. We'll only know that fully when we go to be with Jesus. We can't fully comprehend what it is to see and experience and fully know the glory of God. Paul said this to the Corinthians also, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also him known. But that being said, Paul does say here in verse 18 that the glory which shall be revealed in us, and that glory speaks of our glorification. Okay, so I've just used another word. Then what is glorification? If we're trying to wrap our heads around glory, well, Martin Lloyd Jones put this this way, and I really this was super clarifying for me, to be honest. He said this: glorification means full. An entire deliverance from sin and evil and all their effects and in every respect, body, soul, and spirit, body, mind, and spirit, the whole man will be completely and entirely delivered from every harmful effect of sin, every tarnishing, polluting effect of sin. Not only that, we shall become like the Lord Jesus Christ, perfect men, glorified men and women. He is already glorified we shall be glorified. I love that statement. And he also explained that glorification is essential. We think of we're saved and we're forgiven and we are. But he said you cannot stop there. That glorification, being made like Jesus, that is the end result of our salvation. And he said this, if men were merely forgiven but left as he is, That would mean that the devil was victorious and that God had failed. But thank the Lord, that is not the case, right? And that's not the end. And our glorification is assured. And according to Paul, and here's a fascinating thing about this passage. Think about this. All of creation is anticipating the glorification of us, of God's people. That's what Paul says here. Look with me in verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. That's us. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until 
now. So what is Paul getting at there? I think that's not easy to absorb that on the first round here. What's he getting at? He's acknowledging that creation, all the world around us, it suffers too. Something is deeply wrong. Have you ever noticed that? Everything is not okay, you know, even in, 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 the, in the world around us. And verse 20 speaks of creation being subjected to futility. It's, and it seems clear that this points to the curse. If you look back at Genesis, that God imposed as response to the sin, the disobedience of Adam and Eve. And a result of that, as verse 22 says, is that the whole creation groans. All right, I think we have an idea of what groans means, but this is a deeper sense than just a sigh. It's a, it's a deep sort of inward problem. And what does that mean, that the creation groans? Well, I want to see if I can illustrate this for you guys. And I have a pretty ridiculous photo that I want to show you. Hopefully it's going to come up here. Okay, we're going to get a little lighter here for a sec. So this is... Uh, a dog named Bindi, and this dog is wearing what I didn't hear, I didn't know this before, a coyote vest. Has anybody heard of a coyote vest? Okay, true, it's heard. And uh, this photo is, this is a dog in, a, in an Alaska pet shop, an anchor Alaska, and it was captured by the Wall Street Journal for a story on the impact of the rapidly growing bald eagle population across the U.S. and Canada. All right, so good news. Eagles are making a big-time comeback, apparently, like hundreds of thousands of eagles. We actually saw one at Lake Rad- Radnor Lake a few months ago. But these eagles eat stuff, okay? So that's, um, that's a reality. And this is what the article said. Eagles are strong enough to carry a 12-pound salmon, so a 4-pound dog is nothing, says Mark Robokoff, owner of AK Bark Pet Shop in Anchorage. His shop sells coyote vest, a protective jacket covered in Kevlar and spikes, intended to protect small pets from coyotes. Mr. Rodobakov immediately recognized its potential. In a state with an estimated 30,000 bald eagles, the vest is topped with bright red nylon whiskers that he says scare off the birds from above. And of course, that's what Bindi is wearing. So this might be, feel a little bit silly, But it triggered something in my mind because it reminded me, even in the little simple things of a pet, there's this reality, isn't there? That there's death, there's decay. I would say there's brutality in the world around us, in the created order. And there's still this amazing sense of God's beauty in what he's created. That's absolutely there. But it's also cursed. It's cursed by sin. And so, according to the Apostle Paul, creation is not going to remain in that state. In verse 21, Paul uses the language of deliverance from slavery. That's pretty powerful language, that the creation is going to be delivered. And it's directly linked to the glorious liberty of the children of God. And this correlates to verse 19, where the creation, it says, is eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Which again, that speaks of our glorification as the children of God, when we're revealed as the sons of God. So in a sense, and again, this is fascinating to me, our glorification as God's adopted children, in a sense, it's the trigger point for when this deliverance comes to all of creation. And if you remember, what was given to man? He was given dominion over the creation. And so there's a sense in which the redemption of man goes with the redemption of everything that God made. That's an amazing thought. And so, in, and that's why the apostle can say in verse 20 that God subjected the creation in hope. And verse 22 speaks of the creation laboring with birth pain. So there's this anticipation that we're not stuck in this state of being cursed. And this picture of childbirth has the idea of a mother When she gives birth, she faces great difficulty, right? But there's that anticipation and that joy to come of the child that comes into the world. And so the same analogy is being used here by Paul for the creation. There's these birth pangs, there's this suffering, but there's hope, there's glory to come. 
And this shows that God values his creation. He wants to see it restored. Remember, he said it's good. After he created man and woman, he said it's very good. And so, importantly, that restoration includes us. It includes us, the people of God. Look with me in verse 23. It says, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what, we, what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. And so, just like the creation, we groan too. And that groaning speaks again to the pain, the suffering that we face in this life. And at times, you know, maybe you're at a point in your life, well, well I'm not really suffering. It, it doesn't feel that severe. But then it can just hit you, right? Something happens. You lose someone. Tragedy happens. And all of a sudden, that intensity of that suffering can feel unbearable. It can feel incredibly powerful over us. And again, I want to quote what Elie Wiesel said. He describes, and this is a little bit heavy, but I wanted to say this because it just speaks to how real this is and how bad some people hurt. But he describes how he struggled to communicate his experience as a Holocaust victim. This is what he said. All the dictionary had to offer seemed meager, pale, lifeless. Was there a way to describe the last journey in sealed cattle cars, that last voyage toward the unknown? or the discovery of a demented and glacial universe where to be inhuman was human, where disciplined, educated men in uniform came to kill and innocent children, weary old men came to die, or the countless separations on a single fiery night, the tearing apart of entire families, entire communities, or incredibly, the vanishing of a beautiful, well-behaved little Jewish girl with golden hair and a sad smile, murdered with her mother the very night of their arrival. How was one to speak of them without trembling and a heart broken for all eternity? And so the problem of evil is real. And this example is extreme, I know, but it sadly speaks to an important point. And that is apart from Christ, suffering can leave us at a total loss. And we don't know what to do. And there's many people that we know in this world that are at that place because they don't have Christ like we do. And so they're at a loss. And I'm not sure if Elie Wiesel ever found that. I don't know. I don't know his heart. But Christ, in Christ, that's not the end of our story, is it? We're not stuck in that place of suffering. And as Paul says in verse 23, we are eagerly waiting for the adoption of the redemption of our body. And that's the hope that 24 and 25 verses discuss. And one day, we will experience the glory of God and its fullness. We'll experience in its fullness. Our bodies will be glorified, made like Jesus. Our suffering, pain, and sorrow, that will end forever. That's where the Bible ends, right? There's no more pain, suffering, That comes to an end in Christ. And until that, verse 23 says we have the first fruits of the Spirit. That means we experience this glory in part now through the Holy Spirit, and we anticipate this future of full glory. That's what Paul has been talking about all the way here through Romans. And the experience of the first fruits of the Spirit He's talked about early in chapter 8. He's going to talk about it here in verse 26 and 27. But for now, we still live in bodies vulnerable to sin and suffering. Do you guys agree with that? Every day we struggle with temptation, with frustration, with sadness. We still live in this body that has to deal with that. And yet there's this anticipation of what's to come. John Stott called it the Christian dilemma. He wrote, caught in the tension between what God has inaugurated By giving us his spirit and what he will consummate in our final adoption and redemption, we groan with discomfort and longing. The indwelling spirit gives us joy and the coming glory gives us hope. But in the interim, suspense gives us pain. And that's why we look forward with hope 
to our glorification with Christ. And as we do, Paul commends us in verse 25 to eagerly wait for the hope with perseverance. Eagerly wait for hope with perseverance. So sounds a little bit like two different things, right? Eager, persevering, patience. So how do we resolve that? Well, I love the way John Stott puts this again. He says, we are to wait neither so eagerly that we lose our patience, nor so patiently that we lose our expectation, but eagerly and patiently together. We're waiting for Jesus to come back, aren't we? We're anticipating that. But we don't just shut down while we're waiting. We persevere. We keep going. We keep telling people about Jesus. I recently listened to a story that I think speaks to this point, and it's a story told by the Christian music artist Sandra McCracken, who she wrote the song that the worship team sang this morning, We Will Feast at the House of Zion. And Sandra shared that she dreamed she was in a car and her daughter was waiting curbside to get picked up at the airport. And Sandra was in the back seat of the car and, it, and she was not driving so she couldn't control how fast the car went or when it stopped. You ever had that kind of a dream where you feel it totally out of control? She knew she had to pick up her daughter who was about six years old at the time and in her words, very vulnerable image in this dream. But Sandra couldn't get out of the car, and the driver wouldn't stop, and they kept circling around the airport, and she was trapped in this car in her dream, and finally, she couldn't wait anymore, and she jumped out of that car, and she ran over, and she said she was crying at this point, and threw her arms around her daughter, and she said, I'm always coming back for you. I'm here. And Sandra said, there was resolution in the dream but I was still really emotional when I woke up. And she shared this story with her friend, and this is what her friend said, Sandra, I think you're the little girl in the curb. And Sandra continued, in so many ways, our story, there's the sense that we are waiting at the curb to know that God is coming back to make it okay. And that he has said, I am coming and I have a plan. And the dream I got to experience being the mother and being the one who was earnestly waiting and planning and aiming and eventually running toward her, but she couldn't experience that yet, not fully. I don't know what the weight of dreams like that are, other than to say I think it's a reminder of God's comfort, his heart toward us, that he is like that loving parent that is running and that is earnest and that is holding all things in his control and that he is coming back and that there will be a day when we will remember these things without the tears and we will say together he has done great things. I like that story. And that brings us to the second point I want to share with you guys, and this will be shorter than the first, I promise. That's scary. The assurance of God's sovereign intervention in our life. Look at verse 26 with me. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And here's the main thing I want to see from these verses and share with you. And there's many things you could take from these verses. But God is present in our weakness. Do you guys realize that? God is present at our weakest moments. And not only present, but he's active. He is intervening. He is interceding on our behalf. And can you identify with not knowing how to pray, not knowing what to say? You're at a, at a point of loss and you're like, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to help this person. I don't even know what to ask God for. And it's comforting for me to know that the Spirit is interceding on our behalf. And at the same time, it says God knows our hearts. God knows the mind of the Spirit. So God knows everything. He knows what we need. And the Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf. Later in chapter 8, he also says Jesus is interceding on our behalf at the right hand of the Father. So again, you have this concept of the triune nature of God within this teaching in Romans. In verse 26, the use of the word for groanings, it seems to indicate that God understands our groans. Remember that was in verse 23 earlier? There's a sense in which the Spirit of God is identifying with our suffering and intervening on our behalf understanding the suffering of his people and the effect of sin and death on our lives. And then in 27, 
The Spirit's intercession is said to be according to God's will. Now, don't miss that because that becomes really a theme here as we move forward. According to God's will, that speaks to the fact that God is sovereign. He is over our life as a loving Father intervening on our behalf. And that's a reminder also that the Lordship of Jesus, He is over our lives. He is the Lord. We're not in charge, and He is. In verse 28, Paul continues to build on this point. He says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. That's an incredibly famous verse, and for good reason, right? What an amazing promise that is. And I'm sure many of you have relied on the comfort of those words when you've gone through things that you just don't get, that you don't understand in your life. And on the other hand, You know, we can look back at our life and see some of the circumstances and how they unfolded and the things that happened. And we say, yeah, I can see that. Like God gives us a window into this. He's working all things together for good. Something that seemed unusual, weird, or not even important. God used in this amazing way. If you sort of hit rewind on your life for a minute, I can say that's true about my life and meeting Diana and being married and Hannah coming to our life and us moving here and even being part of this church. You see God putting all these pieces of your life together. That's a good thing to go back and and do. Even if you're young, God has done that since you were tiny, if you were in him. There's a story he's unfolding of your life. At the same time, there's mystery in how God does this. There's mystery in how verse 28 plays out. And it requires faith to believe that God is at work in our lives in ways that we may never fully understand this side of eternity. We might not know, but we have to believe it's true. Douglas Moo makes the point that we must be careful to define good in God's terms and not ours. So what we think is good might not be so good, right? Sometimes I've got a bad perspective on that. And, you know, verse 28 does not mean that everything that happens to us is good. That's not what it's saying. It doesn't say everything that will happen to you as a Christian in your life is good. No, no. And that doesn't mean that God is behind things that are bad. I, I think that's a step too far. But there can be very bad things that just occur because we live in a sinful and a fallen world. And yet God is still at work orchestrating the lives of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And earlier in the letter to Romans, Paul put it this way. I think it's good to reflect back on this. Romans 5, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And here's what I want to highlight. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So in that context, the tribulations, the difficulties, that was what God used for good to build that hope, to strengthen character. And maybe going through that, it didn't look so good, but God can use it. And it's important, though, to recognize these truths apply to people who have placed their faith in Jesus as their resurrected Lord. This truth does not apply to those without Jesus. For them, like we read earlier from Wiesel, the question of why lingers unresolved. I'll be honest with you. I don't know how to resolve that question. The world has incredible amount of evil, incredible amount of suffering. Tony spoke about it earlier. There's war and conflict and people dying even now. How do you resolve that? You can't, apart from, I believe, Jesus Christ. He's not the author of that suffering. I don't believe that either, but he is sovereign and he is the ultimate resolution to that question of evil. There's many people that need to hear that message. I know you guys, I'm sure you know people in your life that need to hear that message. The problem of evil is something that people wrestle with. Young people, teenagers, they ask that question all the time. This isn't some sort of foreign concept. It's very real to people's hearts. But in Christ, nothing in our lives is pointless and ultimately not for our harm. 
And in a sense, nothing is wasted because we don't live any longer for ourselves. We're not the center of the universe, so to speak. It's so easy for us to make ourselves the center of the universe. Our purpose is to live for God's glory. He's the Lord. That's where we find meaning, when we lose ourself. And to that end, God has ordained this glorious plan for our life. He's planned it for all eternity past, and it's good for all eternity forward. Look with me in verse 29. It says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. There is a ton we could go into here from a theological perspective. I'm not going to do it today. I want to look at the sort of practical implication of these words. By all means, dig into the deep theology of it. But I want to look at just briefly here, what do we take from this? And one is, God is the initiator of our faith, not us. God initiates our faith. He knew us from eternity past. He predetermined a plan for us. He called us and he justified us. And remember what the book of Hebrews says? Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He's the initiator. And then number two, the Lord is sovereignly at work in our lives to make us like Jesus, to conform us to his image. And through that process, Jesus is honored. It's not all about us. It says he becomes the firstborn there. I'm sorry, the first, yeah, the firstborn among many brethren. That firstborn has the idea of preeminence. Preeminence. He is the head of the body, the head of the family of God. We're co-heirs with him, but Jesus is the preeminent one. And so when we're glorified, Jesus is glorified. And conforming us to Christ's image takes us back to God's design from the very beginning. When he created man and woman, he made them in the image of himself, in the image of God. That image was marred by sin, But now, through the righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus, God is restoring that image that was marred. And for now, we're a work in process, right? We're becoming more like Jesus through the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. But we still have a body, as we said earlier, constrained by sin, constrained by death. We're still a work in progress. But one day, That will change because we are justified, Paul says. We're made right with God. That's what justified means. And Paul writes that we are also glorified. And notice something really cool here. He says they are glorified. There's a a sense here that it's the past tense in the language that's used. And theologians describe this as the prophetic past tense. In other words, it's so certain to happen in the future that God has described it as already happening. Isn't that cool? There is this certainty that we will experience God's glory, his plan. And that's our great hope. We will one day be glorified with Jesus for his glory. No more suffering, only glory in our bodies, free from sin and death. And then in the meantime, we see today God is with us. The spirit of the living God dwells within us, interceding on our behalf, and the Lord is sovereignly working in our lives. And I want us to take heart in believing that truth and giving God the glory and the praise for that as he works that out in our lives. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the transforming work of your spirit within us. Father, we thank you that you have given us hope in the midst of suffering and pain and difficulty, Lord. And there's been a lot of that in the last year. And Lord, I'm sure there's someone listening today, maybe somebody here in this room today, Father, that's dealing with suffering and maybe has questioned why, Lord, and your goodness. And uh, it just doesn't make sense. And maybe there's something in the past, maybe there's something in the present that's just haunted with them with that, Lord whatever it may be. Father, I pray that you would just remind those people, remind all of us, Lord, that uh, you are present with us, that you walk with us through the pain and the suffering of this life. And Lord, we also thank you that we look forward to this glorious future, 
that you're going to redeem our bodies, that you're going to make us like you, Lord Jesus, that we will live with you and reign with you. And Lord, today we just praise you that you are the preeminent one. You are the firstborn. You are the one we worship and we praise. Lord, we thank you that you are the Lord and that in you we find the answer to all of our difficulties of life. So Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us with this truth, remind us of this truth. When the difficulty comes, remind us, Lord, that you are good, that you love us, that you've done all these things. We just praise you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.